Party. Uh, I am very pleased to uh, be welcoming Dion Stewart to the stage. Uh, Dion and I first met uh, back in April at the Dojo Consortium. Uh, Dion is a, a, a product coach, an agile coach, a technical coach. He, uh, he is a small talk developer back in the day. He is uh, also a, a, just a stand-up guy. I'm really hap happy to have him here on stage, and uh, we're going to hear about the, the DevOps Dojo today from, from Dion. So take it away, Dion. Thanks, Alex. Uh, let's talk about some outcomes to start with. So one team in a dojo in six weeks went from knowing very little to almost nothing about the cloud to having two of their four applications completely migrated to the cloud with a pipeline that did infrastructure as code and completely automated development. Uh, another team that had a dependency on a third-party vendor library that they had been trying to get out of their code base for years, spent six weeks in a dojo, and a couple months follow-up to the dojo. At that point, they had the vendor library removed from, uh, from their application, uh, removed that dependency. Another group of five teams came into the dojo, and after spending six weeks in there and two weeks additional time outside the dojo, they delivered a product that their business partners had been requesting for two years that they had failed to deliver despite repeated attempts. Um, probably even more impressive than that, there was a large retailer that started the very first dojo, and if you had an engineer friend and she came and told you that she was going to work for this company, you would gather your other friends and stage an intervention and say, why are you going to work at this company? They went from sort of that reputation in the local development community to being one of the coolest places to work at in town. And in the process of going through that cultural transformation, they also Many people would argue saved their business. They were sort of at risk of being munched up by one of the large online retailers. So we'll get into how these teams did all that and how that organization did that. Let's start, let's ground ourselves in the third way. I'm sure this concept is not new to many of you, but just to get on the same page. The third way comes from the DevOps handbook. Uh, the DevOps Handbook lists three ways. The first is optimizing the way we work on the value stream, delivering products on the value stream, optimizing the flow of work left to right. So a lot of the techniques and the ways we go about doing this optimization are very well known. We make the work visible, we work in small batches, we build quality in. The second way of DevOps, according to the DevOps Handbook, is amplifying feedback so if the first way is kind of going left to right on the value stream, the second way is going right to left. We can do this sort of at the end of the value stream with things like monitoring and chaos engineering when we're in production. Our build pipelines, our DevOps pipelines that we build are all about providing fast feedback. Did the test pass? Did the static code analysis pass? Did the security scans pass? How can we get feedback for these things into our team's hands as quickly as possible? So again, there's fairly well-known pathways to working and improving the first two ways of DevOps. The third way is a little bit more nebulous. So the third way is about creating a learning culture. It's about creating a culture of experimentation. People have been writing about learning organizations for years. How do we go about creating learning organizations? I think you probably all agree that while the first two uh, even coming in here this morning, you might have ideas about how to improve those first two ways of DevOps. Doing the third way is a little bit more troublesome. The way organizations typically go about trying to improve the skills of their teams and the individuals that work in their organizations is through traditional training. We have these two and three and maybe sometimes five day workshops, uh, but these things are sporadic, and it most maybe you go to two, maybe three a year. Hopefully none of you are in this situation, but every once in a while I run into people from organizations where there's a big conference, and they approve one or two people to go to the conference with the idea that they're gonna save money, and those two people have to take meticulous notes from every session that they go to, and somehow spread that knowledge across the entire rest of the organization. I'm seeing a few chuckles and nods. 
hopefully that's recognition from some past event, not what's happening to you today. Mike Rother, who's pretty well known for introducing the Toyota Kata to organizations, both inside software delivery and outside software delivery, points out that modern day neuroscience actually points out that when we have these kind of training events that are sporadic and spaced throughout the year, what we're really teaching our employees and our people is to do business as usual. We're not teaching them anything new. Um, you might argue that, okay, neuroscience, modern day neuroscience, uh, good thing we're learning that. Uh, we can't let ourselves off the hook that easily. Back in the 1880s, a uh, psychologist named Herman Ebbinghaus came up with something called the forgetting curve. And the basic gist of the forgetting curve says that if we go to a short training event, that's like a one or two training day training event, if we don't immediately start using what we learned, reviewing what we learned, and practicing what we learned, Within about 30 days, you're likely to forget about 90% of what you learned in that two-day training course. So, would you hire this guy? No, I'm glad to hear that's the answer. That should be the answer. Uh, I don't have all these certifications. Some of them are more legitimate than others. I won't call out which ones I think are illegitimate. Even assuming that a lot of these are legitimate, for the ones that you can achieve by going to a short one, two day workshop kind of thing, and then maybe not taking a test or maybe taking a test that no one has ever failed in the history of that body giving that test, um, 30 days later, you're likely to have forgotten 90% of it. So let's say for a second, I did have all those certifications, but I achieved them through this two day training kind of uh, program. I'm likely to have forgotten 90% of this information a long time ago. But this is what we do as an industry, if we're honest. We have all of these kind of training programs. Oh, we need to learn DevOps. Let me go search the web for training providers that have two-day DevOps certification course kinds of things. The implications of this have been questioned for a long time. So this is Andy Hunt. He's one of the co-authors of The Pragmatic Programmer. Uh, he also wrote this book called Pragmatic Thinking and Learning that's been out for quite some time. And he questions this whole approach to training and certification. Kind of the main points here that he's making is, uh, or are, it's not about mastering a body of knowledge. So acquiring new skill is not just about mastering a body of knowledge. It's about building up a model for those new skills. Practicing, questioning, having the opportunity to fail and get feedback on how you're doing with these new skills that you're trying to address. Um, this is not something that typically happens in a two-day training course. So how do we address this? Uh, this is where the dojo comes in. So what is a dojo? Dojo is a Japanese word. It comes from Zen meditation centers and martial arts halls, particularly Aikido halls, and it literally means the place of the way. So the idea behind a dojo is it is a place where you go to learn new skills and a place where as you're learning, you go for repetitive practice. You go with feedback from people who are more advanced in the skill that you're trying to learn than you are. We've been doing dojos in various companies for about five years now. The typical offering that is uh, given inside a dojo is this six-week learning experience. So teams come in for six weeks. There's a little bit of an intake process. I'll dive into this in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, the intake process is there primarily to make sure we know what success looks like for teams before the six-week time period starts. That includes what they're going to be working on while they're in the dojo, and more importantly, what their learning goals are. One thing that makes the dojo significantly different from other training programs or training types of events is teams bring their real world work into the dojo. So all work, all learning is contextual. It takes place while the team is working on their real world work. So I've seen teams, people go to cloud classes, TDD classes, whatever it might be. They feel like they're learning the concepts in these two-day workshops. They get back to their desk on day three and they can't apply it. 
There's something with the way their organization created their own virtual private cloud that doesn't quite jive with what they learned in the class. There's some other security governance constraints that weren't there in the sandbox environments that they had to work in during the two-day training course. And pretty soon they get frustrated and they just drop it. it. It doesn't stick. The learning doesn't stick. The other thing that is sort of a core part of this six-week experience that teams go through in these dojos is we do basically a scrum style of iterative incremental delivery, but we do two and a half day sprints. Now that might sound crazy to some of you, even though there have been people like Ron Jeffries and others that have been working with teams doing one day sprints for a long time. But if you're in an organization doing any kind of agile and you're used to like two week sprints or three week sprints, two and a half days might seem crazy. We re do reduce a lot of the ceremony around uh, doing this. So, there's usually no story points. Uh, instead of worrying about how big something is, the question simply becomes, can we do this in two and a half days? If not, let's break it down into something smaller. Because we're physically co-locating in a place, we don't use JIRA or other agile tools. We simply use cards on a whiteboard or stickies or some other very low fidelity, quick, easy to maneuver and manipulate uh, tracking tool. But teams learn how to break work down, which I think is a much more essential skill than how big is something? Is this an eight or a 13? So to that end, here are some other aspects of what makes uh, these two and a half day sprints really powerful. There's the practice that I talked about that's missing in a lot of typical training events. So if you think about a six week time period, if we're doing two and a half day sprints, we do 12 sprints. So just in terms of getting good at the standard four scrum practices, you've got 12 practice sessions with those as opposed to three if we did two week sprints. Uh, you have many, many attempts at breaking work down into something that could be delivered in two and a half days. I've had teams say, we finally figured out what it means to break something down and get to done the sprint. You know, prior to coming into the dojo, we were always delivering things really late in the two-week cycle, and then the testing always carried over into the next sprint. We were never really finishing anything. We hear a lot of uh, talk these days about psychological safety being an important factor for effective teams and effective improvement and in innovation. Because we're doing two and a half day sprints in the dojo, the risk of going down a wrong alley in terms of design or architecture or some new experiment is minimized to be very small. So if a team fails in two and a half days, it's not such a big deal. We simply reset and change direction. The other thing I, I, I can't stress enough is the dojo is about learning. So one of our mantras inside dojos is kind of learning over delivery. It's not an accelerator. It's not where teams go to deliver more faster. It's where teams go to upskill and learn and organizations invest in their people. This is what it could look like for a couple teams. So another really powerful aspect of the dojo is it's not based on a standard syllabus or curriculum. Part of that intake process is meeting teams where they're at and figuring out what it is that they want to work on. So in some cases, we've had teams come in that are doing new product development. In other cases, the team might not be touching the code in terms of features or new product ideas. They're simply migrating to the cloud. And the coaches who work inside the dojo will customize the learning paths that that team goes through during the six weeks based on their learning goals and what they're trying to accomplish. I talked about the intake process a few minutes ago. Chartering is a key aspect of the intake process. This is something that normally takes about a half a day. It's full team. We do it up to two weeks before. What we're really shooting for are the outcomes that that team is trying to achieve for their learning and their product development or their collaboration or whatever the, the work is that they're doing that the learning happens in context of. We are trying to make sure that the team understands there's sort of a boundary around this time period of six weeks that they're going to be in the dojo for. And one of the ways we will reinforce that is asking them to come up with a name for their team for what they're doing inside the dojo. One team that was doing a cloud migration decided to call themselves Cloud Talica. We went out to the web and found the Metallica font, created laptop stickers, 
And we often have celebrations when teams finish their six week learning experience in the dojo. In this case, we got them a cake with their Cloud Talica logo on top of the cake. Uh, as silly as this might sound, it gives the team a sense of identity that's different for their time in the dojo than outside the dojo. And it very clearly states that what we're doing in here is different from your normal day-to-day -day job. So the physical space. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of having a separate physical space. It, the first dojo I worked in, a lot of the teams were up on the third floor of the building that we had the dojo space in. So even though teams are used to coming into that building every day, the fact that they went to a different location inside the building was sort of this demarcation point that said, what we're doing in here is different from our normal daily work environment. The other thing we'll do is typically we will try to have many teams in the same space uh, together. So the largest dojo I've ever been in had about a dozen teams that could be in that same physical space together. We would stagger the start dates. So if teams are there for six weeks, team here might start this week, two weeks later this team starts, two weeks later this team starts. In addition to getting mentoring and coaching from the dojo coaches who are dedicated as part of the dojo staff, they learn from each other. And there are many serendipitous moments where a team will be working on something, someone in the space right next door to them will kind of overhear, or maybe they'll be walking by, they'll see drawings on a whiteboard, and they'll say, hey, it looks like you're trying to solve the same problem that we solved two weeks ago. Um, I can come over, or why don't you come over, we'll show you our code, and we can show you how we tackled the same problem. In addition to the benefits that are happening just from a learning standpoint in those situations, we found that people are making sort of informal network connections, uh, meeting people that they didn't know before inside their own organization, which has repercussions for their time outside the dojo, where they've got those strong connections. And hey, maybe six months from now, I need to interface with the code that your team writes. Now I know someone on your team. I know a little bit about what your product does. It's easier and, and more quick to have a conversation about integrating. So what does a, a great dojo space look like? Uh, everything should be configurable. My ideal dojo space would be two or three small tables for a team of about eight to 10. Uh, everything on wheels, large TV, lots of whiteboards. In a perfect dojo space, a team could come in and reconfigure their space every morning for the work that they wanted to get done that day uh, or the approach that they wanted to take. So a team might come in this morning and say, we want to do mob programming, full team programming, push the tables together, pop the big screen TV up on one side, everyone sits along the back side, and they do a mob programming session. The next day, maybe the QA people and a developer want to work on some automated test cases. Other people want to work on something for the pipeline. We can break and reconfigure the space to have two or three efforts going on. Everyone's still within earshot of each other. They can kind of turn their chair, shout at each other when they need to have a full group discussion or if questions come up. Uh, but primarily, they're able to reconfigure their space on the fly. Uh, this book, Clever Digs, if any of you are interested in dojo or not, just how to set up spaces that foster creative thinking, collaborative work, uh, would highly recommend this book, Clever Digs, by Jenny Quillian. One of the stories that she tells in that book is a university had a help desk room, basically, for programming students. Undergraduate programming students could go get mentored by graduate students. The space had two rooms, and the graduate students each sat at a desk at the end of one long room. There was a doorway into the other room, and the other room was a common space where people would work on problems. In the back of the common space were a bunch of vending machines. So students would congregate there, and it was kind of noisy in the common space. And one day, a new administrator gets hired, comes into the space, hears the noise, sees a bunch of people congregating in the back of the room by the vending machines and says, okay, here's a problem I have to solve. This is obviously no good. This is meant to be a place where people are getting mentoring and learning how to program. So they immediately go back to their office and figure out how to get those vending machines removed from the space. They get the vending machines out, put up some new signs, sort of library-ish, this is a quiet space, et cetera, et cetera. Administrator comes back a couple weeks later, and the line from the room with the two graduate students' desks 
for people seeking help is going all the way to the back of the room, out the door, and stretching into the other room. And the two graduate students are talking about how overwhelmed they are with requests and they can't keep up with the demand. Long story short, they figured out, as you might imagine, that students are working on common problems. When they had the vending machines there, people would get up, they'd go to get a soda, candy bar, whatever. They'd start talking about their problems. They would overhear each other. They were helping each other solve the problems. They were doing it so effectively that the demand on the two graduate students was low enough that that's all they needed. When they took that ability to network and connect with each other away and forced them into this silent space, all of a sudden the demand went way up. So there's this other social, sort of socio-technical aspect of these dojo spaces that can be really powerful. Um, we're pragmatic about what dojos are. So for us, some of the things that are non-negotiable, it's about team learning, it's about learning over delivery. We have this opportunity for repetition, these two and a half day sprints over six weeks. Uh, the learning is contextual, it's collaborative, you have skilled coaches. Uh, what is, that, that's what's non-negotiable. What is negotiable is the duration. So not every team has to come in for six weeks. Other dojos have created shorter offerings, uh, design sprints, if any of you are familiar with uh, that technique for doing product discovery, rapid iteration and feedback from your customers or potential customers in a week-long time period. Dojos have been set up to do those. Uh, we've done flash builds, um, kind of week-long, anywhere between one day to week-long things where we get a group of people together who don't normally collaborate and sit in the same space in the organization uh, will come in for a shorter period of time. One thing I want to call out real quickly is this term dojo has been around for a while. So the style of dojo that I'm talking about right now is kind of newer. It's been around five years. Prior to that, many of you may have heard of this idea of a coding dojo, where groups of people will get together for an evening. Sometimes it's a meetup style thing over pizza and that kind of thing. And they'll do programming problems as a group together. Uh, the thing that the dojos I'm talking about has in common with this is this core underlying value of deliberate practice, collaborative learning, learning from each other. If any of you are interested in that, Emily Bates' book, The Coding Dojo, is awesome, full of a lot of exercises you could run in those situations. So one thing I love about the DevOps community is it's very metrics driven. We're always talking about measurements. How do we prove DevOps is working? How do we prove our organization is getting better? And while I love that, I'm a consultant, so I talk out of both sides of my mouth. And there's another part of me that knows that there are things that are not easily measurable, but that are true. So I'd like to share a few of those with you today. These apply to dojos, but you could also apply these concepts to any kind of learning situation, team, individual, inside your organization, whether you're on the learning side or sort of the coaching or mentoring side. The first thing is, Always start with the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Look at the outcomes you're trying to achieve, tie them to the value stream, figure out what practices you need to improve on in order to make those improvements. Don't just say, hey, we're moving to Git, why? Because it's cool. Okay, we're moving to Kubernetes, we're doing serverless, why? What outcome are we trying to achieve by adopting these things? You don't necessarily have to address the entire value stream. So the very first dojo that started was a quote DevOps dojo. And I know there's a lot of debate over what DevOps means these days. For them, it was sort of the classical early definition of code commit to running in production, uh, providing customers with value. It was that part of the value stream. So the very first dojo focused on practices that were at that part of the value stream. Things like pipelines, um, automated deployments, infrastructure as code, et cetera. The other thing that's very clear to me is knowledge is not a thing. Uh, language is important, and sometimes we abuse and misuse language. Knowledge transfer is probably one of the worst abuses of language that I have a pet peeve of right now. It's not something that we can simply bottle up and give to someone else, like a commodity like corn or something like that. For an individual to have new knowledge, it has to be created in their own minds. 
We know this from neuroscience. Knowledge creation is literally creating new connections in your brain. It is an act of creation. And the idea that we can simply take someone who has some skill or knowledge in one area, codify it somehow, give it to someone else to consume who may or may not even have contact with the person who codified it, and somehow they're going to obtain that knowledge is kind of absurd. I will acknowledge that it can happen for certain things. For those certain things where it can happen though, the knowledge has to be something that can be made very explicit. So are the, there are these terms that people who talk about learning and knowledge exchange and knowledge creation use tacit versus explicit knowledge. So tacit knowledge is knowledge that we don't even necessarily know we have to begin with. Uh, there have been studies where people follow doctors around with interns and residents doing rounds in the hospital. And they will have asked doctors questions and information about certain diseases and treatments outside the context of the rounds and the doctors aren't able to call up the information. They sort of fall back on textbook answers. When they're doing rounds with actual residents and interns, all of their experience in the context of having to do diagnostic uh, analysis and share information with the students on the spot, all this information comes to the fore. So tacit knowledge is like this a lot of the times. And while with videos and other mediums, we can make more and more things uh, explicit, explicit means we can write them down, you're still missing any opportunity for question and feedback loops when we assume that everything can be made explicit. Uh, the other thing I know to be true is you don't have to design a perfect curriculum up front in order for learning to happen. So one of the things that we often run into as we're helping organizations create these dojos is questions along the lines of, well, what's our playbook? What's our syllabus? What does our curriculum look like? What's the lesson plan? In some cases, it's actually, what's the lesson plan for all 30 days of that six-week experience? I want that defined up front. You don't have to create that kind of curriculum in order for these dojos to be effective. By setting up the outcomes you want to achieve, getting clear on the learning goals and chartering, and doing the work, the work itself will show you what needs to happen. It will show you what skills need to be learned. All right, a couple closing thoughts. The dojo model was started by one company shortly thereafter. It was a large retailer. A large telecommunications company adopted it. A large bank adopted it. There are now over 30 companies that I've got line of sight to that are implementing this dojo model in some format. Um, there was a consortium event. So there's this loose affiliation of these companies that share information with each other about what's working, what's not working, how you can apply this dojo model in your organization. We had an event in Minneapolis in April. There were about 75 people from over 20 different companies who came to share information. That group is growing more and more by the day. One of the speakers we had at that event was Kent Beck. Um, and as much as I'd like to assume everyone knows who Kent Beck is, sometimes people don't. He's the creator of XP, if you're not familiar with him, Extreme Programming. He also created a unit testing library initially in Smalltalk that was then ported to Java as JUnit. We now know it as XUnit. It's been ported to many, many different languages. So if you use any one of those unit testing libraries, it comes ultimately from Kent. So Kent was one of the speakers we had at this consortium event, and he got really excited about this immersive learning style that was having sort of a resurgence. They tried to get companies to adopt this model uh, in late 90s when XP was brand new. It worked for a while, but fizzled out. Uh, finally, shameless self-promotion here. A week from today, a book that I co-authored about creating one of these dojos that goes into a lot more depth than the talk today is coming out. Uh, if you are interested, hold off until next Tuesday. Uh, I've been told by the publisher, the Kindle version, which you can pre-order now, but next Tuesday it'll be on sale for less than a cup of coffee. So you might wanna wait till then. So I've shared uh, kind of what I think the problem is, what this dojo model is. Hopefully some ideas for learning that even if you're not doing a dojo will provide some use for you. Now go out and learn. Thank you.